Hello there and welcome to this live stream all about Physician Associates. My name is Rob Newton. I am a Senior Lecturer in Physician Associate Studies at De Montfort University and I also work part-time as a Physician Associate and um, clinically I work in Children's Acute Medicine. So in this live stream, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about Physician Associates, who we are, how we fit into the health service and what we do. I'll talk to you a little bit about Physician Associate training, and then I'll give you some more information about how the De Montford University Physician Associate programme works. If you have any uh, questions or comments uh, during the presentation, please feel free to comment and I will try to answer as many questions as I can once I have uh, finished the talk. So, um, so who are physician associates? Well, um, compared to other healthcare professions, we're still fairly new um, in the UK. Uh, we're based upon a similar role in the US called physician assistants. Um, and physician assistants in the US have been around for about 50 years. Physician associates in the UK have been around for about 10 years. Um, but what's really interesting is that in the last two or three years, the number of physician associates in the UK has gone up exponentially. And the reason why there are so many more physician associates now is that there is lots of demand for physician associates in the NHS and in the UK um, healthcare workforce. So PAs, as we call them, are healthcare professionals who are trained in general medicine. And we work alongside doctors as part of the medical team, and that can be in hospitals, in the community, um, and in a, a range of other um, situations as well. Uh, unlike doctors, we're classified as a dependent practitioner. So that just means that PAs can't work completely in isolation. So PAs can see patients on their own. They can take histories, examine the patients, formulate management plans for the patients, but uh, physician associates should only work in a situation whereby they can seek help from um, consultants, supervising consultants if they're needed. So PAs will always work in a setting where there is a supervising doctor that they can speak to should they need any advice. One of the aims of physician associates is really to take the pressure off of healthcare teams. So um, obviously, particularly at the moment with the pandemic, there is a lot of pressure on the NHS and um, lots of pressure on doctors. And so physician associates, by being able to do some of the activities that doctors do, they can take some of the pressure away from the traditional medical team. Something else that physician associates can do, which is quite useful, is improve the continuity of care for patients. So because as part of their training, doctors often rotate from one medical specialty to another, they take their expertise with them in their previous specialty. So physician associates, because they tend to be based in one particular clinical area, they get to learn how the area works so that when new doctors rotate into the department, the PA is able to support those doctors and to help them settle into their new clinical role. It also means that um, we get to know the patients who um, often attend that clinical area as well. So we're able to establish uh, longer term relationships with those patients and to support their healthcare needs over a longer period of time. So in terms of the actual day to day activities of a PA, what it is we can do. Um, so as part of our training, we are um, taught how to take medical histories from patients. So to find out about the patient's past medical issues and what's brought them into the healthcare setting on that particular day. We are trained to carry out physical examinations of patients in the same way that doctors are trained to. And we follow the same medical model with our training. Um, we can see patients with undifferentiated diagnoses, so we can see um, patients who are acutely unwell, but we can also see patients who have long-term chronic conditions as well. There's no real um, limit on what a PA can see um, compared to a doctor. Um, we can formulate differential diagnoses and management plans for patients, um, and we can also perform a range of different um, 
diagnostic procedures and therapeutic procedures. So all PAs are trained to do things like take blood, insert cannulas, urinary catheters, we can suture, we can insert nasogastric tubes. There's a whole range of different clinical activities that we can undertake. Um, we will formulate management plans for patients. Um, we may request certain diagnostic studies if we think those are useful for the patient. And we can also prov uh, provide um, health promotion advice, um, disease prevention advice for patients as well. Uh, there are some limits as to what PAs can do. Um, so at the moment, PAs aren't able to prescribe medication in the same way that doctors are. And we're also not able to request uh, imaging studies that involve ionizing radiation. So that would be things like x-rays or um, CT scans. Uh, the reason for this is that because we're a new profession, PAs don't currently have full statutory regulation. Um, it's hoped, well, we know that in um, a year's time we will be getting statutory regulation. So the General Medical Council, which is the organisation that regulates doctors, have announced that they will be regulating physician associates from next year. And we hope that once we have that extra um, sort of safety blanket of statutory regulation, PAs may be able to expand their role so that they can um, undertake activities such as ordering x-rays and uh, prescribing medications but that'll be something that will happen later on in the future it's not something that will happen overnight uh, when PAs become regulated but in the future uh, we hope that we will be able to do things like prescribe um, in terms of physician associate training, um, so PA training is via a postgraduate qualification and it's a two year postgraduate qualification. Um, some organisations, um, universities offer that as a postgraduate diploma, others offer it as a master's degree and the, uh, the DMU uh, PA programme is a master's degree. In order to apply for the programme, um, applicants must have an undergraduate degree in a relevant subject. And so that's things like health sciences, um, life sciences, biomedical science. They may be qualified as a different type of healthcare professional. So they may be a qualified nurse, physiotherapist, pharmacist, something like that. Um, our two year postgraduate course, um, has um, a taught component and a placement component to it. And at the end of that two year course, if our students um, complete that course satisfactorily, they will then enter themselves for a national examination. So regardless of the university that students complete their training at, in order to become a PA who can work in the NHS, they must also pass a national examination. And um, that's run by the Royal College of Physicians. If you are interested in becoming a PA or you are going to apply to a university to train as a PA, I strongly recommend looking at the Faculty of Physician Associates website. And if you Google it, you should be able to find it. So this is a website that tells you all about the physician associate profession. It tells you about um, the study that um, PA students need to undertake. And it will also provide you with more information about the nature of the national examination. So obviously a two year um, postgraduate qualification is a big undertaking. Um, so it makes sense that potential applicants would want to know how much PAs earn. Well, the average salary for a physician associate is currently around £35,000 a year. So if you understand the way in which Agenda for Change works in the NHS, um, most PAs are on Agenda for Change Band 7. Um, some newly qualified PAs will start on a Band 6, and that's usually as part of some sort of internship. Um, and as part of that internship, they will also receive additional education and training in the role. Um, in terms of career progression, uh, there are different ways in which um, the career progression works for a physician associate. Um, so if you want to move up pay grades, um, you would need to take on more responsibility. And increasingly, PAs are doing that. 
And um, so lots of PAs are moving into um, education type roles or managerial roles, um, which allows them to take on more responsibility and therefore work um, at a higher pay band. The other thing that's exciting about the physician associate role is that um, physician associates can move from one medical specialty to another very easily. Um, and that's because physician associates are hired because of their general medical knowledge. That means that if um, I work in paediatrics, for example, if I decided I didn't want to work in paediatrics anymore and I wanted to work in neurosurgery, rather than having to go and do a lot of additional training, I could just apply immediately for a job in neurosurgery as a PA. Um, that means that they can utilise my general medical skills within their department and they can also train me up actually on the job to undertake any sort of specialist role that they want me to do as a neurosurgical PA. So it's very easy for, for PAs to be able to move from one specialty to another and that keeps life interesting, it keeps the job interesting and it keeps your knowledge of medicine very current um, and it gives you a lot of flexibility as a physician associate. So if we talk about the DMU Physician Associate Programme in a little bit more detail now, um, it's a very, very intensive course. So um, unsurprisingly, we are trying to teach you a lot of medicine in a two year course. So it makes sense that it's going to be incredibly intensive and we do ask a lot of our students. Um, so our course runs all year round, so there's no big summer break for our students um, and it's full time. So we warn our students that they should expect to be studying from 9am to 5pm, Monday to Friday, all year round. Uh, it also doesn't follow the standard academic calendar. So as well as having shorter holidays, the course also starts earlier in the year. So our course runs from the beginning of September. And um, in addition to the nine to five Monday to Friday, we will expect students to be doing a significant amount of work um, in other specialty in, in sorry, in um, outside of those hours as well. So in other words, they need to be um, studying in their own time, doing self-directed study. And we recommend that our students do a minimum of 50 hours of study a week, um, because if they're not doing that, those number of hours, then they're probably not gonna be able to keep up with the uh, subject matter that we're talking about. And for that reason, we recommend that our students don't um, take up part time study. Uh, the reason being that the um, university demands an awful lot of the students time and um, our, the students in the past who have undertaken part time study tend to struggle with their times. So if I talk to you now about the structure of the first year of the PA programme in a little bit more detail, um, this schematic here just shows you um, how the, how it works. So. When students begin with us, they start by doing a short module in anatomy and physiology. This is um, essentially to ensure that students from a range of different backgrounds all um, acquire sufficient anatomical knowledge to be able to undertake the rest of the course. Um, obviously, because we hire, well, we take on students from um, relevant undergraduate degrees, we expect our students to have some knowledge in this area already. So this is a very intensive module. On completion of that module, students will then um, complete a module in general medicine in the first term. And this will cover uh, the pathophysiology, it will cover uh, patient presentations, diagnosis and management of a whole range of different conditions. In general medicine, we cover topics like um, cardiology, respiratory medicine, um, gastrointestinal medicine, renal medicine, um, topics like that. And then in the second term, that module is replaced by specialty medicine. And in specialty medicine, we cover things like obstetrics and gynaecology, uh, dermatology, ophthalmology, ear, nose and throat medicine and, and other topics like that. Throughout the first year, students will undertake a module in clinical and professional skills. And um, in this module, we will teach students how to approach patients and communicate with them, how to collect medical history information, how to perform physical examinations. We will talk about how to interpret different test results. 
um, how to perform um, different clinical procedures, uh, such as taking blood, for example. Um, and um, as part of that, we will assess students on a regular basis in their practical skills to make sure that they are competent to be able to go on placement. From the first term of the first year, we send students on placement to primary care. And this involves spending a day a week in a GP practice. Obviously, we send students from about week four of the course, so we don't expect them to do much more than observe to begin with. But as the placement progresses and the student becomes more experienced, they will become more hands on. So they will start to take histories, start to examine patients. And it gives them the opportunity to interact with real people um, early on in the course. In the second term, students will then complete a module in community health, and that covers topics such as mental health, um, infectious diseases, sexual health, and um, a range of other conditions. If we now look at the second year of the programme, whilst the first year of the programme is spent almost entirely at university, the second year of the programme is spent almost entirely on clinical placement. So with the exception of a few academic in days, students spend the entire second year of the course on clinical placement. And the, um, the clinical placements will involve rotating around a number of different uh, medical specialties. And so at the beginning of the year, students will be given a timetable that will tell them exactly where they will go for the whole year um, to acquire the, um, the breadth of experience that they need to acquire. And some of the clinical placements will include uh, general practice, um, going out to community hospitals, um, some students, well, all of the students will rotate around a number of different specialty wards within uh, general hospitals. Students will complete um, 90 hours of mental health placement, 90 hours of surgery, 90 hours of paediatrics, 90 hours of obstetrics and gynaecology, and they will also uh, complete a block of time in emergency medicine as well. Alongside the clinical placement, because it's a master's programme that we offer, the students will be completing a practice based research project, which will be handed in uh, towards the end of the second year. And whilst they're on placement, the uh, students will also be completing a clinical portfolio. And so this will be a, um, a folder of evidence showing that the student is competent um, to to qualify as a physician associate. At the end of the second year, I mentioned earlier that on completion of the DMU course, students must then undertake a national examination. So the national exam, um, like I say, is run by the Royal College of Physicians, and it uh, comprises two parts, a written examination, which is made up of 200 multiple choice questions, and then a practical examination. And this, these are currently run in Liverpool. And these are 14 station um, OSCE exams. So essentially, the student will go from room to room. They'll have 10 minutes in each room to interact with a patient and to complete a particular task. So that might be um, collecting information. It might be examining the patient. It might be um, doing a particular clinical procedure on the patient, but they will do 14 of those. And if they pass a sufficient number of those stations, then they will pass the OSCE. And on com um, passing the OSCE, the students can then register with the professional body and work within the NHS. So whilst we're talking about the DMU programme, I'll just talk to you a little bit about funding and fees. So uh, we anticipate that the fees in for 2021 entry will be £9,250 per year. Um, it's important to note that the course is not eligible for the Vice Chancellor's 2020 scholarship. Um, Currently, our students do receive a um, student support allowance from the um, Health Education East Midlands. Um, we can't guarantee that students will get that every year because we have to apply for it each year. But currently, our students get £5,000 over the two years that they can put towards the costs of the course. So that could be the fees. It could be their accommodation costs. It could be travel costs associated with placement.
Uh, I mentioned placement earlier. Something that it's important to note is that the placements may not necessarily be in Leicester. So we send students on placement throughout the East Midlands. And so students should be aware that they may have to travel um, to other places in the East Midlands as part of their placements. Because our course is a master's degree, um, students are eligible to apply for a postgraduate loan through the student loans company as well. So if I just quickly move on to our entry criteria um, and our selection processes, um, we expect our applicants to have a 2-1 or above in a biological or healthcare related um, subject. So that could be things like medical sciences, biomedical sciences, nursing, pharmacy, subjects like that. In addition to that, students must complete a, um, an enhanced disclosure and barring service application and must also complete um, an occupational health screening questionnaire as part of the process as well. Um, students will be expected to submit a personal statement as part of the application for the course. And in that personal statement, we really want to know your motivation for wanting to become a physician associate and um, to outline the personal qualities that you have, but also the relevant experience that you've had in the past and how that would be relevant uh, to um, training as a physician associate. Um, following the application process, if the application is um, successful at the first stage, we will invite applicants to a selection event. Um, due to COVID, these are currently being performed online um, and that could involve an interview or a number of short tests as part of the selection process. And we anticipate that those selection processes will be starting sort of March, April time next year. Uh, so what I'll do now is give you the opportunity to ask any questions that you have. Um, I will have a look at the comments section and I'll try to answer them in real time. Um, so let's have a look. So there's a question about um, placements in generalist specialties. So um, yes, so um, the way it works is that the Faculty of Physician Associates, which oversees the PA programmes, recommends the amount of time that students spend in different medical specialties. So our students will spend different amounts of time in different specialties. I think I mentioned earlier that in surgery and paediatrics, for example, students need to have 90 hours of placement in those specialties. In other specialties, um, there's it makes more sense for students to spend longer there. So you talk about AMU, for example. AMU is a good place for PAs to um, spend time because they will see a range of different medical presentations. Um, so um, on the general medical placement, that's a longer placement and we um, send students to different medical wards, including AMU, to get experience of a range of different healthcare conditions. Um, the shorter placements tend to be in more niche areas, such as obstetrics and gynaecology, um, where students don't have to have evidence of as many hours in order to pass the course. Um, Questions about DBS. Uh, my understanding is yes. So the DBS needs to be carried out um, with the particular organisation. So I had to fill out separate DBS checks for my university work and my hospital work, for example. So unless it's changed in the last couple of years, and I'm not completely sure, I think you do have to apply for a separate DBS, yes. Um, what's the average week like for a PA student? So um, that depends very much on um, whether it's in the first year or the second year. So in, in the first year, if the student is based at university, um, they could expect um, a couple of days a week of um, theoretical medicine teaching. So that might be the general medicine or the um, specialty medicine module. Um, so our teaching sessions are normally three hours long. Students have three hours in the morning and three hours in the afternoon. Um, students may be attending lectures, they may be undertaking group work, they might be doing problem-based learning during that time. Um, another two days of the week is likely to be taken up with clinical skills teaching. Um, and that may be online or it may be face to face in the clinical skills labs. So for the clinical skills teaching, we are breaking our um, 
cohort down into smaller groups so students have more face-to-face um, -face interaction and smaller group interaction with the lecturers um, so at the moment for example we're teaching clinical skills in sort of groups of six so that we're able to um, observe students closely co correct their technique things like that and then students can also expect to spend a day a week on placement as well so um, as I say from week four of the course students spend a day a week on primary care placement and that just gives them the opportunity to see how what they're learning in university fits into clinical practice and since introducing those placements when our students evaluate them very highly and we've seen an improvement in our um, students understanding of the uh, theoretical knowledge and an improvement in their clinical skills since they've been undertaking those placements. Uh, what are the job opportunities like for PAs? So um, and progression. So I think I've talked about progression already, but in terms of job opportunities, it's looking really good. So I mentioned that the number of um, universities offering PA courses has increased a lot recently, and the number of PAs have increased a lot recently. That's because of demand from local hospitals. So um, the more that different hospitals and general practice providers are becoming aware of PAs, the bigger the demand. Um, if you're considering becoming a PA and you're interested, I would strongly recommend looking at NHS jobs. If you just type in physician associate, you'll see the range of jobs that are available um, to PAs at the moment. If you do that and you don't see many jobs, just be aware that they tend to the applications tend to peak at um, certain times of year. So because the PA students qualify in September and in January, you tend to see more applications, sorry, more adverts coming out at those times. But it'll give you an idea of the range of different specialties that are hiring PAs as well. So to my knowledge now, I don't think there are any medical or surgical specialties in the UK that aren't hiring physician associates somewhere in the country. So um, if you have a very specific interest in a particular aspect of medicine, chances are there's a PA working in that area of medicine somewhere in the UK. Um, so yeah, how are placements coordinated and where might they take place? So um, my colleague Nick um, oversees all of the placements and um, as I say, when students start their second year, they will be given a timetable that outlines the placements that they'll be doing and where they'll be doing them. Um, as I say, our placements can take place anywhere in the East Midlands. So within Leicester, that could be the Leicester Royal Infirmary, the General Hospital or Glenfield Hospital. We have a number of uh, GP practices um, in Leicestershire, Warwickshire, uh, I think there's some in Nottinghamshire and Derbyshire that we may also send students to. Wherever possible, we will try to place students in, in GP practices that are near to where they're based, but we can't always guarantee that. So we always warn students that we may expect them to undertake a fair bit of travel as part of the um, as part of the PA course. Um, some placements, um, hospital placements, also take place in Kettering in Northamptonshire, uh, and potentially down into uh, Northampton as well. Um, so there's no guarantee that students will necessarily be based in Leicester. Okay, so I can't see any more questions coming up. So um, thank you very much for listening to this. I hope you found it useful. Um, if you have any more questions, um, we are happy to get back to you um, with answers. Um, if you email hlsmarketing at dmu.ac.uk, they will make sure that um, if they can't answer the email, they'll forward it to a member of the PA team and we will get back to you with the information as soon as we can. So again, thank you for listening and have a lovely evening.